good, af good afternoon and evening to everybody. Uh, my name is Cheryl, and I am an uh, honorary lecturer at the uh, University of Queensland. Um, today, is, uh, my, I have the distinct pleasure of sharing this particular seminar. And, uh, and before I, I introduce uh, Dominic, uh, I would just like to share a few words and thoughts with regard to the, the, the today's subject matter. Um, one of the things that we, uh, we struggle is this idea of what our careers, our trajectories look like, especially when we are educators. Many of us come from very different backgrounds, from very diff uh, different sort of specializations and, and disciplines. And yet when we get into the schools, there's this idea of what we would like to offer to our students <laughs> and goals to the institutions. And more often than not, the best way for us to educate values, uh, purpose, vision, ethics is through ensemble uh, and music making. So, you know, and, you know, in, in retrospect, there hasn't been enough conversations with regard to how these life stages of an educator uh, kind of look like. What were some of the challenges, what are some of the issues that each and every one of us as educators would have faced? Some of these issues are common. At the some end, of the, Some of these are, yeah, some of these are, uh, are unique to, to each and every one of us. So for today, I'd like to introduce Dominic Fitzgerald, who happens to be the academic music coordinator and the acting head of choirs at the Brisbane Boys College in Tuong, Brisbane. He has worked at Brisbane Boys College since 2015 and teaches undergraduate musicianship classes at the University of Queensland. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Dominic also enjoys working as a lay clerk uh, at St. John's Anglican Cathedral in Brisbane City, where he sings under the direction of Dr. Graham Morton. His undergraduate study was at the Queensland Conservatorium, Griffith University, and his postgraduate study was completed at the Sydney Conservatorium, University of Sydney. Both of these degrees were focused on cello performance, and Dominic's primary, which is the Dominic's primary instrument. Dominic has played the cellos in many orchestral chambers, solo and continual capacities. Choral music has become a large dimension of Dominic's life since 2015 and he's conducted choirs at Brisbane Boys College, given choral workshops, and been guest choral conducting since 2017. Without further ado, Dominic. Thank you very much, Charles. That's very, very kind of you, and good evening to, to everyone. Thank you very much for involving me in this um, project, and uh, what we're really hoping to do, what I'm really hoping to do this evening is to um, add my um, input to this really interesting, sounding a uh, really interesting catalogue of, of information that's being being put together um, by Shah and Bing. So thank you very very much for the opportunity um, for that. Um, so just um, rehashing on from um, what Shah said, just in terms of who I am. Um, yeah, academic music uh, coordinator at Brisbane Boys College. So I teach uh, classroom music, not in the co curricula. Um, instrumental music program. Uh, I look after everything to do with the classes um, with students, mostly from uh, year seven to twelve. I certainly teach only from seven to twelve, um, but we have a really active junior school uh, program as well. And we believe we're the only boys' school in Australia um, to host uh, what we call the Music Every Day program, where the little boys in prep to grade three have a music lesson for half an hour every day of the week, um, which we're very, very proud of indeed. Um, I work with the TTBB choir here at the school and the SATB choir as well. Um, being in a boys context, the SATB choir is dealing with uh, trebles um, rather than uh, sopranos. And so um, that lends the rep puts the repertoire that we do in, in a certain um, direction, but not not too much. We, we're very proud of, them, of, of what, we, what we do put up and, and uh, work like Mozart Requiem and, and Chunks of the Sire and other things of that sort of nature um, make their splash at our school, which we're really, really pleased about. Um, since 2018, I've uh, also worked at UQ, um, uh, teaching in undergrad musicianship courses um, and uh, doing little stints in music education as well, which I really do enjoy very much. And I've sung at the Dom Cathedral uh, since 2015 as well as tenor. Um, and through that, um, aspect of my life um, have been become more involved in some other groups like Mr. Chamber Choir and Trent Boys and a little bit with Opera Queensland as well, uh, which is really, really good. Since, uh, so because before uh, 2015, as I'll discuss more um, later in this presentation, I'd never sung really anything at all anywhere, um, certainly with, with no um, serious thought behind it. So, so um, the shift into choral music has been a, a wonderful 
um, new area of development, as I mentioned um, in my life since, uh, since that particular year. And while the title of this says Chat from Chalice to Musician, of course, it's sort of slightly silly because the Chalice is a musician of sorts, but um, to grow into a more um, wholesome and consummate musician is, is what I really feel has occurred to me over the last seven years. And I'm looking forward to seeing what happens over the next period of my life um, in this dimension. So, um, through the course of this presentation, um, these are the sorts of things that I'm, I'm hoping to achieve this evening. Um, my life as a cellist, as a, as a choral singer, as, as a conductor, a music listener, um, someone who's interested in language, someone who's interested in beauty and uh, aesthetics and how they um, feed each other. Um, the big point that I really want to crack in all of this is how much better a musician I feel I am, as I just said before, now than I was um, several years ago um, and how the processes of um, learning to understand choral music and engaging in choral music uh, have led back so deeply into my cello playing, into my teaching, into my thinking, um, more generally just into, um, into my musical identity. Um, which brings up the, the next point, um, how, in my view, um, experiences are interrelated. You know, we, we, we're not individual grains of sand. We, we are all connected by, um, by uh, all sorts of things. And, and experiences don't exist just in isolation. They, they, they almost always have some relation to other things, which brings the question of what is relevant and irrelevant into, um, into the frame. And uh, that's something that I've argued quite strongly um, with students uh, and just a few uh, key experiences um, over, over the last few years of my life um, that have been particularly seminal and um, really at the end yeah linking experiences um, and enthusiasms together um, as a teacher as a conductor as a musician as a music participant in um, society at the moment um, and as a proponent of music and music education so they're roughly the sorts of things that i'm hoping to um, get through in the next 25, 30 minutes. Um, so I went through my background. I don't need to do this um, really uh, all again, but I just want to just uh, say that uh, without the um, state education program in Queensland, uh, which I'm personally extremely proud that the Queensland home, um, I probably never would have really played the cello um, to, to a serious extent or engaged in music um, to, to the extent that, that I have. Um, but while both my parents were very uh, highly educated people and people who are very interested in music and wanting me to um, wanting me to experience music, without the support of the state um, state funded programs, uh, that would have been really extremely difficult to the point of probably impractical. Um, when I was a child, and so I've always been hugely grateful um, for for my early roots in in the um, in the state primary schools of Queensland, and, and having uh, really wonderful teachers and and, and opportunities available to me. Um, and then the shift into uh, private cello lessons as I got a little bit older. Um, I put primary school choir in there just to say that through the course of my primary years, whilst I, I sang in the choir in grade four, five, and six, and seven, um, it's not something that I hugely uh, remember with, with, with great, um, not necessarily great fondness, but just necessarily, but just great impact. And, and that's something that I'd, I'd like to return to later in, in the session, particularly when I talk about um, recruiting boys into into choral programs but but i do suspect that part of that was just the banality of, of so much of the repertoire that we did as children um and uh in contrast to coming out of strings where we were doing reductions of things like prokofiev's troika and, and and other really terrific music um to to move into into really quite inane um, banal primary school choir music was, was a real shame and i think that was a hugely lost opportunity actually um, and, and something that I think educators need to be really, really quite aware of um, in terms of what are we doing with our young people? Do we want it to just be a free and easy pastime or, or is it, or is this really a, a, a serious golden opportunity to be transformative? Um, through my secondary school years, um, my, uh, my secondary school didn't really have much of a music program and my big, um, my big musical learning occurred through the Queensland Music that magnificent organisation that I am so hugely uh, fond of and committed to now as a, as a music teacher. 
Um, but uh, also interestingly, and I haven't listed this here, but um, I, I would really say very strongly that my father was, was a hugely important part of my music education through the years of, well, continues to be now, but particularly from the years of about 12 to about 20. Um, when in discovering by myself, having someone to go and speak to about it with great seriousness, even though um, my father couldn't play an instrument. He was a very, very serious music listener and scholarly fellow um, who, you know, when I discovered a new Bartok string quartet or something, you know, would, would um, discuss that with me with, with, with not only just great interest, uh, but with a, a great sense of knowledge from the experience of, of a deeply devoted listener. Um, and I've always been very grateful for that relationship. And it's taught me a huge amount of my own teaching um, about the importance of, of sharing. And for students, when they have great experiences and they come to you wanting to share that moment and that enthusiasm, um, the vital importance of, for us as teachers to be able to grasp that moment and take it somewhere. Um, I speak often to the music education students at UQ when I get to see them about, what are you going to do with a kid who's, who plays in QIO or does something in there? school orchestra or some, find something on Spotify, it doesn't matter what the experience is, and comes to you and says, I heard this thing called Appalachian Spring by this guy called Copland, and they probably mispronounced the, the composer's name, and, and, and it, was, it was really cool. And what are you going to do in that moment? Are you going to say, I don't know what that is, and squash the moment for the child? Or are you going to say, oh, this is an extraordinary piece. Yeah, Copland was a wonderful composer, and you should go and also investigate the clarinet concerto and the third symphony um, and then tell them something about it and wear them off somewhere else. And this is what dad was able to do with me so wonderfully through my teenage years, uh, and for which I've always been deeply, deeply grateful. But I think that's a really important point um, for, teachers, for teachers everywhere um, to take moments with students and take them somewhere rather than flip them full flat on their face and then, and then, and then, and then die. Going on, um, the, uh, this is just my, um, the first two degrees, of course, were just my usual, uh, which is my undergrad and, and postgrad degrees. But the um, University of Queensland experience in 2015, um, the graduate diploma in secondary education, is where the rubber really hit the road with what we're talking about this evening. I went into that course um, with a great interest in, in going into secondary music education. I, I um, by that stage of my life, had done six years of study at university in, in just in music, not in education, just in music. Uh, and I felt that I had a certain amount to offer um, young people and to offer the cause of, of music education. And in that, um, in that year, uh, the selection of, of courses came up and there was a course on being involved in high school choirs or being involved in some choirs in, in school. Um, and I saw it was being taken by Dr. Anne Morton. And um, I had known of Graham for a long time um, because my father had worked at uh, St. Peter's Lutheran College where, where Graham used to work. Uh, and I've been a few times to see the wonderful St. Peter's Chorale, wonderful and seminal, if I can use that word as well, the influence that that great country has had on the Um And I'll talk about that a little later on as well. Um, but I've been to see St. Peter's Chorale a few times, uh, which was a tremendous experience. Uh, and I, so I knew Graham's name and, and this, this serious person who, with whom I wanted to really get uh, build a relationship. And those classes were, were really, really fabulous in, in, in my view. I had a, a, a tremendously interesting time through that year and, um, and Graham um, recruited me into the St. John's Cathedral Choir, which I've always been deeply grateful for as well, because not only has that been an outstanding experience in itself of its own volition, but it's also um, led to a whole series of other um, other experiences, including doing this this evening. Um, and so I've, I've always been very, very grateful for that that moment in May 2015. Um, with um, regard to the um, choral courses, though, um, that we were doing at at UQ, this is this was where um, my expansion into choral music really started. And um, I look back on that time now and think how much I thought so like a cellist through those classes rather than um, rather than like a more um, concentrated musician. So if we go on, uh, this is, that's just a rehash of that and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. If I can put up here, um, just getting into some, some 
real work. The first thing that we ever did uh, in the EQ um, choral conducting class was the Palace Third Mode Melody, and it has it has different text set to it in different um, contexts. But I just put the first um, couple of bars in here, and I remember the, I was one of the first students to want to get up and, and conduct the rest of the class, and I'd done a fair bit of conducting before in an orchestral context. Um, conducting has always been something that I've found extremely interesting and deeply appealing. Um, when I was in my undergrad um, years, I used to do a lot of conducting for the Contemporary Music Ensemble and friends of mine who were composers studying with people like Cherry Brophy and Harada Dirie um, would often get me to conduct their pieces, which I was always grateful for that opportunity. Anyway, um, we went to this choral class and I went up and thought, you know, we'll guide them through this. And I'm very focused on beats and putting things in exactly the right place and making sure that it was very, very in time and all this sort of stuff. And uh, in retrospect, um, this whole idea of what sits at the top of the hierarchy um, it was uh, started to become a question because the staying together and having really strict rhythm um, was the thing that was sitting at the top of the hierarchy for that at, at that particular point um, seven or eight years ago. But um, in Graham's class, what started to open up was this idea of, well, you really have to beat this in patterns. You really have to beat this at all. What are you actually trying to achieve at the front of the room? What, what are you doing with these people? And I found all this, not necessarily, I wouldn't use the word confronting, but certainly eye-opening because, because it was just so hugely different. Um, and this was the, the beginnings of starting to think about music slightly differently for me. And I think in a, in a much more um, helpful way. Um, and so if I go on to um, this next slide, it's really, really important, um, as I just uh, put here, context is absolutely everything. And what sits at the, high, at the top of the hierarchy um, depends greatly on context. So if you take this Thomas Tallis um, um, material, one, th there are so many things to consider. Are we trying to deal with? Uh, units of the beat being in minims, are we wanting to emphasize voicing in final chords, are we wanting to um, create phrases that are three bars or six bars or eight bars in length, all of this sort of stuff. What is the interplay between voices? I think I ca it can't really be under it, understated, the importance of students singing in choirs, because whilst we know um, that orchestral players read one line at a time and choristers read four or six or eight or however many there are. Uh, while we know that and we, we sort of think, oh yeah, well, of course that's the case. Um, it really is quite a different thing to actually act that out for years at a time um, and, and, and to do that in, in a longer form um, fashion. And so I have to say that that after a couple of years of, of, of doing this, well, actually a couple of months of doing this with, with uh, St John's Cathedral Choir in, in 2015, I realised how much more I was thinking harmonically than just melodically. Um, the coming out of the orchestral world, thinking melodically all the time is, is incredibly important. Um, but starting to think more harmonically um, was something that I noticed occurring really quite a lot. And this, one of the things that's become a, a really big part of my musicianship in more recent years is this idea of, well, where are stress points? Um, lying and singers so much more naturally tend to lend themselves to this idea of um, in, in conventional points five to one rather than quite five one crashing down on, on tonic chords but rather releasing on tonic chords because there's no tension in tonic chords tension exists in dominant chords and dominant function chords um, and this is one of these sorts of moments where with these experiences of, of, of thinking much more harmonically about about stress points to do with text and all that sort of thing, and we'll come to text in a minute. Um, leading back into cello playing, when when we returned to when I returned to the same cello playing, thinking more harmonically about where are we phrasing towards and, and where is the tension in the line and, and then where is the release in the line is something that I learned entirely through singing rather than through um, rather than through cello playing. And if we go on to this next slide, this is just a, a simple example, but this is a very famous opening of the first Bach cello suite. Um, and it's a really interesting question when you look at the score, what are we actually seeing? 
and I'll just play. I'm just going to repeat this and then just play a trick. Um, beautiful Shoggy and Kara just playing the opening measures for us. I hope you can hear this. <laughs> Etc. And you know, it's such an incredibly famous piece, and unfortunately, it's been ruined by car ads and all the rest of it. But I'll just jump back to where we were. Yeah. So, um, if we're looking at these first four measures of, of, of the first box in G major, what are we seeing on the page? You know, are we seeing a lot of notes? Are we seeing uh, three slurred notes and five separate notes? Are we seeing a lot of semiquavers? Are we seeing a, a G pedal plunk drone with, with, with closely related keys on top? Are we seeing a, a one four five seven one progression in G major? Um, or are we seeing, and this is more how I think now, are we seeing one tension free bar, one bar is slightly richer harmony, you know, chord four is just such a magical thing in itself. Uh, one bar of tension of the dominant seven, then one bar, and then a final bar of resolution. And without um, taking the cello out of the situation, um, I think I'd still be stuck back on things like points one, two, three, and if you're lucky, maybe four. But I don't think, I, I do not think that I would have been able to have gotten to the freedom um, of thinking about that final point there, of thinking in more in. Um, in harmonic implication, uh, and I feel like that's something that's really come very, very strongly for being involved um, deeply in, in, in the singing world. Um, also, um, in uh, the soulfar world as well, I, I did a certain amount of um, can I processes in, in my early years of, of teacher training, and I found that quite a helpful crutch um, of building of building more secure oral skills, um, particularly for someone who never really had to deal with things like sight singing in, in my university years um having having those sorts of um leg ups in in the early stages was really really helpful um but to be able to think one tension free bar one bar of richer harmony one bar of tension and one final bar of resolution is something that now when i approach pretty much anything playing the cello i'm constantly thinking of harmonic function um i'm wanting to think of 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 where are we um, moving towards all of this sort of stuff rather than just thinking notes at a time and the Burdensome implications of of of, of technical um, technical inhibitions and 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 um, yeah um, technical issues. So this this is a really really important point um, to me of starting of thinking more harmonically rather than just simply instrumentally. But how do we see what's on the page in, in a multitude of different ways? And the thing that um, that choral music gives to us is is text, and that's one of the really really fabulous things about this. And I've just put um, down here. I was talking to a colleague the other day about this, and, and he's the head of strings here at um, at my school. And he was saying, you know, it's really interesting with with um, with lines of text. If you give different stress points or different implications, then then you have a whole stack of different meanings. If, if you want to how you want to say it, I've just put a wonderful quote here from Bleak House of Charles Dickens, that incredibly virtuosic, wonderful novel um, that's said by Lady Deadlock in the early stages of, of, of the book. Um, it's she's looking out the window and sees that it is. She's a, a wealthy woman who lives a, a, a pretty boring, miserable life. Um, and she's looking out the window on a rainy day, and her husband, Sir Leslie Dedlock, says to her, is it still raining, my love? And she says, yes, it is, and I am bored to death with it, bored to death with this place, bored to death with my life, bored to death with myself. And it's a it's a lovely play on uh, on words, and, and it's a classic Dickensian um, sentence. Um, but if we go back to the, uh, to the music context, the um that idea of the word bored that comes up every time are you going to put stress up on that are you going to put stress on the word death are you going of the text um, completely. And we have to play with this as choral musicians all the time. When you go back, when I go back to playing cello though, or, or a, you know, it's, 
it doesn't matter any sort of cadence at the end. Um, are we going to put emphasis on the G? Are we going to put emphasis on the dominant function of the cadence point? Are we going to put um, emphasis on, on the connecting material, all this sort of stuff? What is the most important thing? What brings that particular phrase to life? Playing notes in a dead fashion is, is really not creating music, it's simply replicating notes. Um, and for, as a, as a teacher, I find hugely important when working with music extension students here at school, and if I hadn't done choral music, I wouldn't do this now. Um, it's so important for students who play, it doesn't matter what instrument, um, to take great lines of text, or even just, like, even just sentences that you make up for yourself, and say it three different ways, five different ways, six different ways. Um, so, and, and then get the student to go back to the phrase that they're playing and interrogate the phrase that they're playing and decide where is the point of greatest tension? How are you going to build architecture to get to that point? And then how are you going to release from it? So that the listener um, has a bigger and better experience than any like major arpeggio in quavers in 4-4 four, four or, something, or, or something, you know, it's, it's, it's just, that's just too dead. Um, and once um, phrases like this um, are, are embodied into students, then, you know, I mean, go further and go into, into truly great stuff. You know, um, these sorts of short takes a rose, thou art sick, and the invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy, and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. And that's such a wonderful. Um, uh, text, a wonderful poem by William Blake. Um, hopefully you know, and if you don't know, please do go and investigate um, Benjamin Britten's Serenade for Strings, Tenor and Horn, where um, this is set as one of the movements, an absolutely sterling um, musical experience, and, and that, that wonderful text lends itself uh, to it so well. And so um, this idea of um, synthesizing um, well, sorry, rather than synthesizing, assimilating text into oneself and, and going and to get students to walk around the campus saying these sorts of things to themselves and getting them to recite out loud from memory um, is, is, I think, really, really important. And the from memory part really matters because um, if we give them something like this and say, you're going to memorize that by tomorrow and anybody can do that. Um, and they come to music extension class and before they play the Hummel Trumpet Concerto or something, it's... Um, you're going to say this to us now, not just in some bland way, but really have made decisions about phrasing, and they've memorized it, then we, that, um, that text has been taken into them, and, and we use that expression for memorization of doing something by heart, and this is really important because it's, it, to do something by heart is not just to simply be able to recite it, but by heart really means it can become synthesized and assimilated into our souls, and this is a really big brings education into a big context because being able to give them great passages of text, whether that's um, whether that's in poetry or whether that's in experiences in school choir, then feeds hugely back into what they um, can achieve instrumentally if they're not primarily um, a singer or, or haven't had experience with um, or haven't had experience with uh, with text recitation um, before. So, um, so making those sorts of decisions about where the stress points lie, do they lie with the nouns, do they lie with the articles, do they lie with the pronouns, do they lie with the adjectives, or are they in a, a whole um, different series of places, which is usually going to be the case, um, also then, then brings them back into their own piece and asks them, and asks them, is the most important part of the phrase within the same equation, within the um, the consistently ascending perfect fourths so within the plagal cadences at the end, within the uh, eight seven eight voicing of uh, in in or, or whatever it doesn't matter. Um, but building the association of, of of text to into music is has been for, for me I found absolutely proven in, in my own teaching to be a great um, uh, tool for improving uh, students' phrasing ability. And when did I really first uh, start to think about this? Um, back in, I think it was August of 2016, we had a fabulous visit uh, at St. John's from the choir of the Temple Church in London, where the um, music director is uh, Roger Sayer, a very amazing and consummate musician, from, and I think, um, and a fabulous organ player and conductor and, and just a you know, brilliant human being. 
Um, and um, we had a, there was a wonderful concert that he conducted on a Saturday night um, where uh, they did um, the Britain Ceremony of Carols. It was the first time I ever heard that piece live. Uh, it was, was, in that, uh, was in that concert and it was really, really tremendous. Um, and the next day, uh, we did a matin service and we did the Hulls um, Colreg, the Te Deum and Jubilate, which is, I, I will never forget the intensity of the last 45 seconds of the Te Deum. That was an extremely powerful experience. Um, but the point that I wanted to really make about that, that service was that, as in there are in all services, there was a psalm. And in Anglican tradition, we, we sing the psalm. And, and in, in the fourth part, in that, in that context. And um, the word and was used in, in uh, one of the verses and in one of the sentences. And Roger Sayer sang with such intensity, just half shouting at, at, the, at the group in, in the rehearsal. Um, I, I can't remember what the psalm was, but something happened and then something else happened. And I hadn't really until that point in time ever considered how incredibly exciting and important conjunctions are. We think we're just joining sentences together, but really this is, you know, telling a story and then something else is, is occurring. Um, this was a really seminal moment um, for me and just associating that into, um, into back into uh, perhaps an orchestral context, chamber music context, any music context, it really doesn't matter. Why do we not think about cadences um, in this way? Why do we not think about passing notes in this way? Why don't we think about auxiliary notes in this way? Any material that connects one thing to another can be seen as conjunction in music. And we have to decide, is it something that's worth highlighting? I came down from the top of the mountain and said, you know, is, is it connecting in a dramatic way? Or is it connecting in, a not, in an inconsequential way, which so often conjunctions are as well. So often it's totally appropriate not to stress conjunctions at all because you simply interrupt line. And we have to be able to make those decisions as musicians. And so doing that in um, in the choral context, in, and uh, in doing that in the choral context, uh, was sort of so seminal for me to, to be able to take that back into um, other contexts of my own cello playing, but also, more importantly, as an educator, to um, be able to impact students in uh, contexts like music extension performance seminars and and really um, anything that students are playing. So often we see these really dull moments in um, in classroom music education where students may perform something to the class for assessment and the teacher will say, oh, that's very nice, just keep practicing, you know, rubbish. Um, and when you ask them afterwards, why didn't you say more to them? The teacher says, oh, well, I, I don't want to get in the way of their own private teacher, which is a totally legitimate thing. Um, but will really also say, and I didn't really know what else to say. And I mean, there's so much to, to, to unpack with that. Uh, if you don't really have anything better to say to the students, well, you should probably not be teaching in the classroom. But um, within phrasing, looking in a granular, high-resolution way at what's on the page, and this is absolutely appropriate down to grade 1A, prelim, preliminary A and B repertoire, um, deciding um, if the note is, as, uh, it implies dominant function, you know, second degree of scale, fifth degree of scale, then we lean into that more because that's something like it could be seen as a conjunction, it can be seen as a stress point in, in language. And if, if, it, if the note has a tonic function, then it can be black mode. And, and I felt that to be a hugely important thing for students of, of all um, of all age groups and start to be thinking far more musically um, than just simply a teacher saying something is sort of lame to play expressively to them. Um, well, what does that really mean? And how can the student go and find the tools to go and play expressively? To play expressively means to be able to look deeply into the phrase and 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 make artistic decisions. And so, um, looking uh, as I've just said here with with um, with text is a fantastic way to start that. But it's I must impress that it's not simply just to start. This is a big long journey to go. Uh, um, on deeply with and in a really granular uh, way with, and I now really sit there keep thinking about every syllable that comes up in terms of in terms of word stress um, and and its implication, which then leads back into when I'm looking at any score, 
what does what do these quavers mean? What do these semi-quavers mean? What is the implication for every single note here? Why did the composer put it on the page? It all matters. Going on. And yeah, and just moving uh, into that. Once you start really dissecting one aspect, I think you really want to do it more. Um, playing with text opens the door to me of really looking into into the whole big mosaic um, of, of of music making, and I'm I'm very very grateful for that because I would have never really thought to do that um, if I if I'd never gone at it through the the, the text path. Um, and so I've always been been hugely grateful for that. The second point uh, there, what's at the top of the hierarchy? What makes the music music what, uh, is, is such an important question. Um, so often students are told this trash thing that the first beat is the strong beat of the bar. Now, what if, like, I mean, who really puts a rule on that? Um, what happens if on the first beat of the bar uh, you've had a resolution to a tonic chord after a dominant seventh chord on the fourth beat of bar before or third beat of bar before, or whatever? Um, what about the voicing? What about what about syllables if it's in a sung context? What about melodic contour? What about so many other things? Should we really be putting stress on the first beat of the bar um, just because that's, you know, the, the, some sort of simple prosaic rule? Really not a good idea at all. And there's so much uh, in that to be taken from, um, of course, the Renaissance context. Um, when singing Palestrina and William Byrd and, and whatever, um, Talus and Lapis and, and, and Victoria, um, looking for um, looking at text primarily, looking at um, looking at melodic shape, looking at the, uh, the change of text, looking looking at you know the, the whole list of, of stuff that, that we're always looking for in Renaissance music um, really highlights to us the importance of not simply just being slaves to bar lines. And one of the things that really does kill musical thinking, I think, uh, particularly amongst young people, because this for some reason have this bashed into them, is just being a slave to bar lines. Don't be a slave to bar lines. Bar lines are there for geographical convenience for us to make sense of the page. Um, what, where real full stops lie and real commas lie and real punctuation marks lie um, is in cadences, is in, is in voicing, is in text changes, all of this sort of stuff. Um, and I've been really, really grateful for the fact that I now think about these things completely differently now um, to 10 years ago. Um, just looking at it back the other way, it, it, it's an important and interesting um, thing that this is not a one-way street, it's, it's very much a two-way street. Um, I've just put up here, uh, too fairly what you would consider perhaps as an unrelated uh, a piece of music, um, the wonderful and very very deeply inspiring Fourth Symphony of Bruckner. Um, I mean, any symphony of Bruckner is, is a deeply inspiring experience, but four is, is a particularly wonderful one. Um, and it begins with that fabulous, hushed uh, E-flat major tremolo chord rising like a mist down the strings with golden sunshine you go into it. It's, it's an incredibly uh, dramatic opening. Uh, before the horn enters with that with that wonderful descending fifth. Um, and I put up the top there, uh, music from a contemporary uh, British composer, Will Todd, uh, a really lovely uh, Christmas piece, actually. Um, My Lord Has Come, beautiful, beautiful work. And uh, I'm actually rehearsing My Lord Has Come um, at the moment with my, my group at school. And the, um, last Friday morning, when I went to start the thing, I, I said, no, no, the, the opening, it really is, something like Brooklyn's Fourth Symphony or, or you know, it could be any Brooklyn Symphony because so, so many of them start with the, um, with, with the tremolo string opening um, and that, that bed of richness. And of course, for the, the kids in the choir, it's like, well, what's Brooklyn's Fourth Symphony? And, and taking a speaker in and sending them a recording up and saying, no, you must listen to this is really, really important because that um, R vowel in the nature um, context and um, has to, both it has to emerge, but emerge firmly out of the silence. Daniel Barenboim has written this wonderful book called um, Everything is Connected and, and talks in the opening paragraph about how music either emerges from silence or interrupts the silence, but sits ultimately on a blank canvas of silence. And it's a lovely image and, and both pieces like um, that uh, Will Todd Carroll and, and Bruckner Four 
do very much emerge out of, out of the silence. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful image. Um, and how do we make this moment successful? You know, is it, it as, as Carol Singh is in, in the, in the little plot piece, you know, um, preparing the vowel, breathing the vowel, preparing air and, and aspirate attack and, and all this sort of thing and, and soft palate and space. Um, and how do, how, how are string players going to do that? And it's, you know, this thing of bow and from the string and and um, the point of contact and and how close to the bridge and which part of the bone all this sort of thing. Now, are the two ideas related? Well, I think they very much are. Um, and talking to to students about that really is, I find, really terrific because, um, as I'll make a point in the next slide, I think, um, for the students to think of themselves as musicians is, I think, really really critical. Not to think of themselves. Um, just as string players, just as brass players, or just as, you know, as choristers or, 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 or electric guitarists or whatever, um, but to think in a musical way. And so one of the big dimensions of being a musician is that in order to create a sound, you first have to, in your mind, conceive what that sound is going to be. And unless you have a broad and rich palette of, of colours um, in, your, in, your, um, in your ear and in your mind's eye, uh, to draw upon, then then uh, you're going to paint a very dull image. And so, if I can just rest into this point, what we um, what sort of what sort of colour we make um, as as a singer can so be be drawn from any image um, that we've had in our lives, whether that's a musical one or or, or whether it's not a, a visual art one or something from nature. Uh, I'm reminded of that amazing moment. Uh, in Gustav Mahler's life when he went to America and he was working in New York and uh, the New York Philharmonic uh, took him up to Niagara um, to see this great natural phenomenon and he stood over Niagara Falls um, in in the viewing um, place where in, in that, that amazing context just viewing this extraordinary natural phenomenon holding on to the fence and and people said that his hands were shaking um, and and someone and he wouldn't leave. And someone said to him, "You know, we probably should go." And he turned to them. He said, "Finally, um, I've heard for the first time in my life fortissimo." And I think that's a really really nice image that 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 the colours that we we um, have in our, in our minds are drawn from our experiences. And as teachers, if we don't have that broad palette of colours to to draw upon, then um, then what we bring to the students is very very pale. Um, so I, I, I think that's that's really really quite um, quite important. Go on to the next one. Um, yeah, this this sort of stuff as well. At the opening of of, of um, that my lord has come piece, like it's in G major, very much. It's not a G major chord. And it's also the opening of Beethoven's fourth piano concerto. It's not a G major chord. It's the opening of the Goldberg variation. There, there are these wonderful associations. To be made, and you know, when you look at the opening of the Goldberg variation, like well, there's this fabulous piece that opens in G major by Will Todd, a contemporary British composer, um, called My Lord Has Come. No experience is bad experience um, because these things, these things are all interrelated. And actually, I just put a note down that everything is connected. Um, is, is, um, and what, what. The more um, sound, yeah, that we're engaged in, the more reference points we have, um, the more each individual piece, sound, moment, breath, articulation, point, all of that sort of stuff um, is connected to our moments. And as teachers, bringing things into um, in into connection for, for students um, is 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 what makes learning the is what makes learning the but such a wonderful, vibrant, um, scholarly activity um, rather than some sort of nonsense fun thing. <laughs> Um, I realize the time is, is against us, so I'll, I'll press on. Um, but um, I just, I, as I just said before, this sort of attitude is hugely uh, important in, in education generally. If you look at the second point here, we're working with choirs on mission. Um, I find referencing string quartet coaching that I had as a student or that I give now. Um, and, and, you know, master classes from great quartets that I was fortunate to have sessions with in, in my. Um, in my postgraduate degree, um, but techniques around tuning chords, you know, um, manage the fifths first and then add, add the thirds afterwards. These sorts of simple things that, that, that are totally, um, totally embodied um, practices for string players and not for some singers. But if you, if you um, bring this into a school context and say, you know, in string quartet playing, when intonation amongst the four voices is so paramount, um, this is a set of processes. Then for students in the senior music class, um, 
for the singers in the next time that um, the next time that a um, a violinist or a cellist gets up and they're managing tuning chords, and this is some sort of association and helpful piece of feedback that they um, they can give to their their own colleagues and peer learning um, occurs. Um, so and 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 the other way um, around as well for for string players to be able to say to singers. Um, well, you know, when you're in a group, uh, it can be very, very helpful to, to tune the fifth first and, and then and then manage um, thirds after that. Um, creating connection in the classroom and in ensembles built is a huge community builder and um, and bringing people together um, is is um, can build curiosity through the diversity of, of, of groups. Um, and so we can share what there is to share within our own groups, and then what is idiosyncratic to our own instrument is our own um, stuff as well. Um, Shah, I realise time's against us. Have I got another minute or two? Great. Okay, terrific. I just want to talk about liking and disliking. Um, liking and disliking is something that's thrown around a lot. Why on earth do we talk so much about what we like and what we don't like? You know, students, and more to the point, what students like and what students don't like. Um, the, the issue with that, I find, is that there's just such a lack of, of um, taking an analytical attitude into a context. Um, and I've just put up here, um, you know, on the, the right hand side is, is one of the iterations of my um, creation of the Shivani, um, which is considered, you know, a very pretty picture. And it is a very beautiful picture. Uh, but on the left hand side is perhaps a little bit more confronting an extract from uh, Vasily Kandinsky's composition number eight, which is a phenomenal. Uh, piece that hangs from the Guggenheim. And, you know, what are we seeing there? Well, you know, lines and squares and all the rest of it. And this raises that really simple, but so often neglected um, idea of Piaget's, that of, of assimilation of new knowledge, that when we encounter something new, it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable, and that's because it's new. Um, but with repeated um, um, touch points with it and seeing it from different contexts and in different ways and whatever, we grow to understand it more and we go from a state of disequilibrium back into a state of equilibrium through the construction of new psychological schemata. Um, and that all sounds sort of very complex, but when you say to 16 or 17 year olds, well, do you remember the first time that you drank coffee? And they say, yes, and they make a face and say, oh, I thought it tasted terrible. And you say, but what do you think of it now? And they say, oh, it's pretty good now. Um, and you know, you say to a 25 year old, do you remember the first time you tried to drink wine, you know, and, and they, they make a face and then ask them what they think of it now. It, it's such a simple thing, but if we didn't strive for new experiences with an analytical brain, then we'd still be eating baby food and we wouldn't dress ourselves properly and all this sort of thing. So it's a hugely integral part of maturation, um, not necessarily pushing ourselves just into something we don't like, but to something that we're unfamiliar with. And thinking about it as liking and disliking is both very unhelpful. Um, just a final association I wanted to put in here. Um, there's a sort of sensational piece of uh, computer style that I've hugely loved since 2015 when I discovered it, called Once on a Mountain by the great Australian composer Stephen Leake. And I remember the first time that I heard the second movement, Look, There Are Dark Hands. That incredible percussive um, sound in, in, that, in that dancing 5 8 3 8 2 4 uh, sound. I thought, you know, this just reminds me so much of Stravinsky. And it really... Um, is one of those moments where with a, a strong, um, big palette of colours in, in your mind, and you write a spring so well, um, and had never heard this piece before, but it made, it made, I wouldn't say total sense in the first listening, I listened to it several times, but it was immediately so hugely appealing because that state of equilibrium in, in my in my mind, the Piaget idea, was already partially built. Um, and so housing this new information was was just so comfortable um and and that's that's a piece that i just i really think it's just such an amazing achievement um that, that was um commissioned and, and and performed first by by a high school choir um 30 whatever it is five years ago now really really sensational just amazing um i'll leave that uh, i can leave that uh, for later but uh, but i would just uh, say that with recruiting boys into choral groups one of the things that i think people so often make mistakes with is um choosing to do things with, with kids in rehearsals because they think they're going to be fun rather than thinking that they're going to be great. And I find so often here that smart, capable boys aren't really interested in having fun. They're interested in things being good and and excellent um, sells and trades in a way that, that fun really doesn't. Um, and, you know, fun is cheap, quick trivia hit, but, um, but um, excellent.
excellence and transformative and all this sort of stuff is teaching someone to fish for a lifetime. It's, it's, it's you know, um, something I think is, is really hugely important. Um, individual relationships, focusing on technique. Um, one of the things that, that sort of a bit controversial, but I think is, is sort of a reasonably settled point psychologically is that one of the, while men and women are mostly are much more similar than they are different, one of the things about men that, that, that separates them from women is they tend to be more interested in things and women tend to be more interested in people in general. It's, it, that's not necessarily the case for every single person, but just in, in general. And taking a more technical focus to singing um, with boys, I, we find is, is, very, is very, very successful, um, focusing on physiology of it and all this sort of stuff. Um, and that is a really, really successful way of getting really bright boys engaged. Um, and that's just some advice at the end, but, but look, um, actively involve oneself in as much music as possible. Um, get away from the realms of what you like and don't like and, and think uh, and think in an analytical way. Um, more, um, there's no such thing as irrelevant, I don't think. You know, there really is. It's, it's, it, um, no experience is a bad experience if you think that it's adding to your palette of colors and what you're going to associate. Um, to in the future and what you and what you're going to associate with students. Um, learn to sing for music teachers. I've been so lucky to have a wonderful colleague here, Brett Holland, who's who's given me some lessons over over the years, which I've been really really grateful for. Um, and and of course actively doing it. Um, and think about your own experiences. Yeah, it's fluid and airborne, so they can be applied to other contexts. Um, but actively involve yourself in as much music as possible and be a musician. Don't just think that you're there to do spreadsheets and, and you know, administration, goodness gracious me. Anyway, sorry, Shah, I realize I've gone slightly over. Thank you very, very much. No worries. Uh, thank you, Dominic, for uh, such insightful and, uh, uh, you know, content heavy <laughs> presentation. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, but no, it's, it's, it's great. It's great. I mean, um, uh, I mean, I'm going to start off with a, with a commentary um, and in part just to kind of um, un, uh, link back to the the abstract that we, we've uh, co-created mm -hmm. together. The idea of strategies of action as argued by Ed, uh, Anne Swidler talks mm -hmm. about how, you know, an individual kind of collects all these different strategies, different thoughts, ideas, um, and puts it in this particular basket where you know you know he or she can can pick and choose to kind of use all these particular toolkits, these cultural toolkits, uh, in the face of you know meeting day to day challenges. And I think to kind of link that very specific uh, framing back to the conversation that we are we are currently having, um, more often than not, um, you know, uh, each educator coming out of university and going straight into schools have this grand imagining of what their classroom looks like. But more often than not, you know, the the landscape is very, very different. And you know, it's 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 varied, you know, and the 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 sort of uh, I mean a, a part of the variations come from the number of students they have, the sort of engagements uh that uh, the students have in their own you know uh, personal time, mm. uh, opportunities for them to actually make music and so on and so forth and you know there's there's also these different conversations i'm not quite sure whether they're still relevant but you know in, in my time when i was in uq too there are these conversations about you know being in in the urban spaces you know being in you know in Brisbane central as opposed to being in you know, uh, schools outside of the, the greater North metropolitan area um more often than not i think a lot of this uh the uh, teachers who are starting their their journeys uh felt ill-equipped in a sense whereby they they had no sort of trope, no sort of story or uh, narrative that they can fall back on and to see what success looks like, right? Mm. And you know, in part, um, we what we also what you are sharing and what we are also advocating is not basically a template of success, but rather you know a, a, a whole repertory of things that we can pick and choose to be whether and it is up to the individual to kind of decide on whether it's appropriate or not appropriate, right? And at the end of the day, it's also about us uh, uh, accumulating all these different strategies, you know, be it from books, um, you know, and, you know, speaking of speaking of uh, books, uh, Graham, when I last visited Graham in 2015, right, and then he, you know, he just introduced me, hey, have you read this book? Uh, it's yeah. Stacey Horn, I think. Um, right, Graham? Or Stacey Horn? Right. Uh, the writer? If you say so. 
<laughs> and you know, you know, just this lovely lady who's just narrating her her life journey in singing in choirs and how you know it was for her transformative and you know she embedded all these lovely stories about the Welsh choirs and all this. It you no know, reading that you know and reading it from the perspective of a chorister, reading it from mm. the perspective of why music making was important. Uh, that also transformed my own biases and my own sort of perceptions on on what music making is all about, right? Especially when some of us also not only teach in context of, of schools, but also lead community-based ensembles, right? And for the record, if I can interrupt, the title of the book is Imperfect Harmony. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, it is, it is so lovely. So, you know, on this lovely note, um, is there any uh, uh, anyone here would like to ask a question or you know, give a comment? Ashley or Graham? I have no comment and no questions at all. My only comment is to actually congratulate Dom for all that he gives the music community. But you can all see that, that in future generations, you know, the legacy of the students who will have come out from his classroom is going to be so amazing in music education and indeed for community cultural life generally. Bravo. Thank you sir, very much. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, if there are no other questions, um, at the time, I'm mindful of the time, it's not, uh, it's not. Yes, sorry, I went the time. Um, and uh, um, as, as chair, I'll just wrap up the seminar. Thank you so much everybody for attending. Thank you so much again, Dominic, for, for sharing with us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you, know, you again uh, in November where we'll have Paul and Hope sharing mm. about his works. Okay, without further ado, thank you and good night. Thank you.